In this episode of Voice of the Sea, we're studying the ocean from the world's deepest research station, the Aloha Cable Observatory, known as the ACO. The ACO provides real-time observations, including lights, camera, and sound from the ocean floor. We'll meet the researchers who drive the remotely operated vehicle Luukai to the observatory, who study and analyze the data collected there, and who repair, maintain, and enhance the capabilities of the ACO. We start off in Honolulu Harbor at the UH Marine Research Center, talking with engineer Blue Eisen. What is really neat or cool about the ACO? We're the deepest observatory on the planet. It's uh, 4,729 meters, which is almost three miles straight down in the ocean. It's very cold, about one degree C, over 7,000 PSI of water pressure. And we provide a view into an environment that literally only a handful of people have ever seen. I understand that you actually helped design and engineer part of the Aloha Cable Observatory? Yeah, so my job is, is split between the ROV and ACO. I package it and get it ready to deploy uh, out to the Aloha Cable Observatory, and then I kind of change my hat to ROV operator and actually go execute that. Starting this year, I've been promoted to lead pilot and so I'm involved with the, the maintenance and operation of the ROV as well as actually executing the, the science missions. And can you tell me a little bit about what, what kinds of operations the ROV Luukai is good for? One of the, the key characteristics of it is we're rated to 6,000 meters. We're one of the deeper ROVs, not necessarily the deepest, but there's not a whole lot of ROVs out there that can go that deep. And being here in Hawaii, there's quite a bit of opportunities to get down to the seafloor. The kind of the plane out there is somewhere around 5,000 meters, and, and we've done several projects there. They range from biological sampling, uh, geology, fish, corals, and then most recently the Aloha Cable Observatory. With ACO, we have power and data, basically a plug down in the bottom of the ocean. And, and we can plug in the instruments, and, and now we have camera. Maybe you can share the website, but people can actually go and see live footage of the bottom of the ocean, which sounds exciting, but things down there are really <laughs> slow. <laughs> so if you're, if you're a biologist and you're studying uh, urchins, for example, and one happens to walk in front of the camera, that's really exciting. But for the rest of us, it's more of just a thrill to know where that camera is. It's kind of like having a camera in outer space or something, and you get a, a view of something that you would not normally be able to see. Can you kind of walk me through this cruise and the different tasks that you performed? We deployed two different instrument packages and we have really creative names, basic sensor package four and basic sensor package five. One of them is a, a CTD, which is an instrument that measures parameters of physical oceanography that are kind of basic measurements. Most oceanographers start with CTD and then get more information from there. But we were also planning on recovering some lights that had failed. So we built what we call an elevator. It's basically a, a big float and put some weights on that float along with the CTD package and literally drop it off the ship. It, it free falls down to the bottom and we're able to track it with uh, ultra short baseline uh, beacons. And basically that's uh, an acoustic way of, of locating something remotely. We find out where it got on the bottom, and then we launch the ROV and go get it. And we basically take that whole package, which is the float, the instruments, and a weight, and we move that to where we want the instruments to be, and then we unpack it. In this case, we have 50-meter cables on a spool, and we're able to mount those spools onto the front of the ROV, spool out the cable to the main plug, connect everything. At that point, we call the shore. They turn things on, confirm we're getting data flow and all that kind of stuff. This is the ROV Luukai. It's actually a two-part system, and it's in shop mode, so it doesn't quite look like this on the ship. Mm -hmm. This is what we call the TMS, the tether management system. It actually stacks and sits on top of the ROV. So there's a cable that comes down from the ship into the TMS. We've got three uh, optical fibers for communication that go through that cable, and then also our high voltage conductors. Once we're in position, we undock, separate the two. There's a green soft tether that 
the ROV is still connected to, and this is just hanging underneath the ship, and we can drive the ROV around within the radius, whatever the length of the tether is, roughly about 50 meters. So we've got um, seven different thrusters on the vehicle. These, uh, we refer to the quads, so four on, one on each corner. The, the front ones are slightly angled out and the back ones are slightly angled in. So we do go straight forward, but with those angles, we can also do lateral movements left and right without actually turning. And then there's three vertical thrusters, which are all tied together. So you can thrust up or thrust down with the verticals. So our whole kit is basically all of this stuff around us. A 20 foot shipping container houses the control van. Can we take a look in there? Oh, sure. So this is actually where you would drive the ROV from? Um, yeah, pilot sits here, navigator here, and manipulator here. We basically have four different camera views. The HD camera is the primary camera, and that's on a pan and tilt, so we can kind of look around and zoom, all those kind of things with that one. And then there's various navigation screens, and then the manipulator screens. There's a a fisheye camera, which the manipulators like because it gives them a little bit more uh, depth of field when they're trying to connect various physical things down there. One interesting thing about this is if you, you saw a picture of the arm, this is a little miniature version of that arm with all the same articulations. So whatever this does in the hands of the operator, the, the what we call the slave unit, so this is the master unit, that's the slave unit, does the exact same motion. So if you want to extend the shoulder, for example, you bring that down. If you want to extend the elbow, you bring that out. If you want to rotate the wrist, you can rotate this part. And then there's little grip sensors here for, for open jaw and closed jaw. You've got hydraulic pressure at about 2,000 PSI. You got a lot of power and it's easy to overdo it. You can, you can literally um, crush things with that arm and you don't have that tactile feedback. You don't know how hard you're squeezing it other than by the visual through the cameras. So everything goes really slow and gentle. And, and then the, the one on the port side is more like a backhoe. It's got the, the same kind of uh, controls and manipulations for that and it's controlled with this joystick here. Next, Marine Tech, Juliana Dell. What does a Marine Tech do? I work on the Kill Moana here. When we have science cruises on board, we have ship's crew, we have engineering, and then you have new scientists that just come aboard and they don't know the ship, they don't know how to facilitate whatever data they want. So that's what a marine tech does. We make sure that we communicate with all departments and that we can effectively get all of their data and all of their science needs uh, in a safe and efficient way. And do you only work on the Kilo Moana? Yeah, this is uh, my only ship here. I've been here for four years. Everyone kind of comes from their own little path. We do electronics, we do internet, we do uh, CTD stuff, sensor stuff, deck, deck work. So everyone kind of has their own little niche and you bring it in and we kind of do a really good job of filling in each other's positions. But me specifically, I really enjoy sonars and multi-beams, uh, CTD work, deck work. We're kind of the jack of all trades, master of none really. And for this last cruise going out to the ACO, the Aloha Cable Observatory, what was your role there? Yeah, so I shifted from ship side kind of to the science side a little bit, uh, and I was working on the ROV team. You can't have this too high in case the TMS hits it. But if you're ever on this line for deployment, you have to just make sure that it's not caught up on this beacon. Right here, where it goes down, there's oh, yeah. some really on that. I'm part-time navigator and pilot in training uh, with the Luukai. Pilot is definitely where I'm, I'm headed. I love being in the zone and being like, okay, I'm gonna manage everything that's going on. And that's really what I learned this cruise is like, pilot is so much more than just sitting in the chair and playing with the vehicle and driving around. It's about managing the situation, planning ahead. And that's something that I really like doing. And I definitely wanna move that forward in my career. We're doing 24 hour ops. So we have to get some sleep. So we assign ourselves into certain watches. I see. So I have a watch um, and I have a manipulator arm guy with me or girl, as well as a navigator with me. And so we all work together to achieve the scientific goals. And it's really cool. The more experience you get with your watch team, the, the more you're like, you cannot take my guys away from me. I need this person on my left and this person on my right and this is how we're gonna get it done and 
It's really cool how you just work as a team. The University of Hawaii's Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. We're talking with undergraduate liaison, Samantha Hanson who was on board the research vessel Kilo Moana and helped her fellow students connect with the crews and virtually join the ROV dives to the Aloha Cabled Observatory. The observatory is very spread out. There is the central node, which is connected to the cable that connects back to the land. And then from this node, you can sort of think of it as an extension cord and it has a plug on each side, and these are all connected to an instrument. We're currently trying to spread out the instruments from our central node and sort of decluster so that the ROV can move more efficiently and work and replace things that break more easily. And so it is very widely spread out. I believe the cables are now 50 meters from the central node in a star-shaped pattern. One of the purposes of this trip was to get good footage of each of these cables and pieces so that we could create a 3D map. So having these 3D rendered maps will be invaluable for navigation. This is the computer lab where I spent most of my time in order to communicate with the bridge. This is sort of the go-between between the ROV and the bridge for communications, for navigation, and if the ship needed to turn in order to allow the ROV to move more effectively. This is me in the computer lab with Megan uh, during one of our live stream sessions. We were attempting to do a voiceover of some of the events that were going on with the ROV. At this time, I believe the ROV was uh, chiseling away at some calcium carbonate that had formed around one of the electrodes, just doing some basic upkeep and maintenance. Uh, this is the central node of the Aloha Cabled Observatory. Here on the bottom, you can see some of the calcium carbonate. Um, it had actually hardened into aragonite that had formed on the electrode. Is that that big? Yes. Wow. There's a lot of it. Yes, this is three years worth of growth. And one of the ROV's maintenance jobs was to uh, chip away at this aragonite. Here I believe it's uh, positioning itself and then it will open out its drawer and take out a chisel. Um, unfortunately, the ROV was a bit light that day and so when it used the chisel, it bounced off. And so uh, it was later decided to use the mantis claw to scrape away at the aragonite and grab at it. And it was very effective. this program is to be a student liaison. I ran an Instagram blog in which I posted about daily uh, to provide some factual information about the cruise. I also ran a live stream just about every day of the cruise. All right, good morning. We are live from the Aloha Cable Observatory. While they were live streaming the dive, I was talking to Samantha about, oh, what are you guys doing? You know, what are you looking for down there? This is a research experience for undergraduates program offered by the University of Hawaii through the Earth Sciences Department. We're working with some mentors and, and other people to give us a real experience in how research is done. We are looking for a few heroes, mentors, trailblazers, innovators a passion to change lives, spark curiosity, open hearts, and awaken minds, help students answer the question, who am I? This could be your calling, but this is no job. It's the journey of a lifetime. Be a hero. Be a teacher. We're at the Aloha Cabled Observatory Lab on the UH Manoa campus. Talking story with researchers Jim Potamra and Bruce Howe to learn how the ACO is powered and how data is collected. This is the, the cable that connects continents together. 
the Aloha Cable Observatory uses, reuses the first generation of these fiber optic cables. And it was installed in 1988, going to California, and then in 2007, Fred Dunabeer went out and cut it and, and put a proof module on to, to make sure it was all working. So it's the deepest power and internet connection on the planet. The Aloha Cable Observatory is about 100 kilometers northwest of Oahu. Correct, 100 kilometers. The, the cable connecting is actually about 230 back to Makaha Shore Station. So you mentioned that the one you're using for the Aloha Cable Observatory, the fiber optic cable, there is a first generation one. Does that mean that it, it it's not carrying as much data? Correct, or? correct. It, it's tiny amount. It's, it's like 100 megabit per second. That's what we, we, we can only do 100 megabit per second. So it's like what you get in your home, you know, now. So in addition to data, is it also sending electricity? Yes, so, so there's, you can see here, there's a little copper around the steel strength wires. Mm -hmm. And so we, we can extract at this, at the Loja station, uh, a thousand watts, which is like a hair dryer. It's powering the lights on the camera we just installed, which are 50 watts each. You know, it's not much, but it, it's a lot more than nothing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> making measurements of the surface is, is relatively easy, and, and you have access to power and communication. But once you get down a few hundred meters, you know, the, the, the ball game changes, and it just becomes much, much more difficult. There are very few measurements in the deep ocean, so anything is, is great. In this case, we can conti have a continuous time series of, of sort of conventional oceanographic things like temperature, salinity. So we do now have 10 years of continuous temperature data, for instance, and salinity. And we are seeing uh, signals of, of interest from an oceanographic point of view. Sort of conventional idea was that the deep sea would kind of be continuous over time, it was sort of the same temperature, there's no seasonality in the really deep part of the ocean, but you're saying that the hot cruises had observed anomalous temperatures changes, and then you guys have been able to verify that with the observatory? Correct, yeah. So, I mean, we're not, we're not in the truly open ocean, the flat abyssal plains. We're in a, in a 200 meter deep basin, and, and just to the east are 100 meter seamounts, and, and our thinking is there's water that sloshes over the sill through those seamounts into our basin. So it has implications for global ocean mixing. How well does the ocean mix, and how much influence does topography have on that? So the measurements we make locally could have an impact in understanding ocean mixing. With the continuous sampling, though, I imagine that there's also continuous data flow. So analyzing that or watching all the video, how do you deal with, with all the data? Well, that, that's absolutely <laughs> a challenge and, and we're still grappling with that. We, we also have acoustic data too, and that, that's high data rate. There's no real good solution yet, frankly. I mean, it means someone sitting down with, with these huge data sets and just crunching the numbers. Now maybe with artificial intelligence there might be some development, but all the, all the data is publicly available. All the, the simple data like temperature salinity, that's an FTP site, so you just download these files. The hydrophone data, well, we stream the data live, so you, you could literally record it. One of the problems we have had is lights failing, so we don't have that much video data. We're more hopeful that this new We've had seven lights on the seafloor and they've all failed. And, and we just recovered two finally after several years and, and they both flooded. We don't know if it's the connector or the light pressure case itself yet. I see a lot of electronics and circuitry around the lab here. Do you guys build these yes. circuitry yourselves? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jim Jolly, our engineer here, has, has built all of this. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for coming by. <laughs> Welcome to the uh, ACO lab. Awesome. So this is where we do all of the pre-cruise 
design and development and post crews monitoring and prepping the equipment. Great, show me around. Yeah, we'll just start right here. This is what we call an acoustic Doppler current profiler. So this is an instrument that measures current. There's four transducers on the top. These send out an acoustic signal mm -hmm. and measure the recorded time it, it takes to come back. So it'll bounce off something in the water and come back and that speed gives us a velocity. Here is what we call our, our bench node or bench testing facility. And so here's another instrument that we use to measure temperature and salinity. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to see, but there's a, a temperature probe inside this sleeve right here. And there's a pump that will pump seawater through a measurement that actually is calculating conductivity. So it measures an electrical signal. Conductivity is based on temperature and salinity. So we measure temperature and we measure conductivity. And from that, we get, we get salinity. So this is a, another important instrument for us. These are you know, not cheap instruments for a variety of reasons. They work underwater. And so pressure is a big deal for us. If seawater intrudes in electronics, it's just not gonna work. So this is a big pressure case here. You know, it's a titanium cylinder where all the, or most of the guts are in. This right here is, it's a replica of what we have on the seafloor at the ACO. You see these, these plugs that are more permanent, but on the seafloor, we can actually plug and unplug instruments as needed. And so we just had a cruise that went out and unplugged a light that was broken and plugged in a new camera, and that's working. But it is very expensive to go out to sea and put the submersible in the water. So being able to have this real-time monitoring is absolutely crucial for us. And we do have engineers that look at this all the time, because if we do see strange signals, we want to catch them before they short out. If, if there's a problem, on the equivalent of this on the seafloor, then the whole thing is dead and you know, we just have to wait until next year or whenever we, we go back out to fix it. Climate variability is obviously top on everyone's mind. And there's this idea that the ocean is absorbing all the excess heat that's being generated and trapped in, in, in the Earth's atmosphere. And if that is being sequestered in the ocean, we should be able to see that on the seafloor. And so our hope is like these CO2 curves that you see from the land-based observatories, we might see temperature trends in the deep ocean. And we don't quite have the time record to see any long-term trends with significance, but you know, every day we're finding new things. You know, there's spikes in temperature. It, 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 just as one example, it's long been felt at this depth, the ocean's just not doing anything. It's still, it's quiet, temperature's not changing, but we see a lot of variability that we haven't yet explained. So it's kind of, kind of exciting. From, the Aloha Cable and Observatory recently celebrated 10 years of ongoing operations. With its lights, cameras, and microphone, the data collected by the ACO is giving us new understandings of the deep ocean. You can follow the data, listen to, and watch the deep sea live from the ACO's website. Learn more at voiceofthesea.org. Follow us on social media at Voice of the Sea TV. Mahalo for watching Voice of the Sea. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is the dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. The award-winning Fluid Earth and Living Ocean textbooks are now interactive and online. New activities, updated content, and a teacher community. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now freely available. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org.